I am an engineer and I've worked with uh, many of the large corporations in various places around the world. Uh, my last job that was a kind of a turning point was working in Alberta on a pipeline project where we transported natural gas from Alberta to the US. And I realized that wasn't the legacy I wanted to leave behind for my life. So I left that job and I've, I've, been, I've had to be a little determined myself going against the grain and working in some different jobs with uh, salaries that aren't quite comparable. However, that's also exciting. And I have attended uh, a couple of the United Nations climate change talks. And the big eureka moment for me was uh, attending the last one in Poland and looking at the technology and solutions they have for climate change within the communities. And they're, they're simple solutions. They're uh, like rain barrels, solar hot water systems, like all these technologies that we've had for ages and many that are re being reinvented from our grandparents. So my point today is that it's up to you and I to make the difference. So I'm gonna, these are the three points I'm gonna be reinforcing throughout. The law of nature is that change is constant. So if we can observe that and be determined, not get frustrated, then we will find solutions to all the challenges that are essentially local and simple. And we must be the change. Some people know me. I, I, I did a home renovation. I became a bit of a collector of things and I appreciate the beauty in articles. And sometimes they just sit around. So they're located in my basement and shed, even in the front room. So I'm trying to clear out some of that space. It's not junk, but it's stuff. So I, I took an inventory of my stuff and uh, power tools, indoor equipment, outdoor equipment, like rakes, shovels, etc. And it totaled almost $40,000. That included the appliances. And then I said, okay, how often are these used? And several, several of them were only used minutes per year. Uh, snowblower, uh, extension ladders, some of my power tools. So then I thought, wow, I wonder how many of my neighbors are in a similar situation. And I actually don't know my neighbors' names. So I decided to knock on some neighborhood doors, introduce myself, and ask if I could do a small inventory of their stuff as well. Turned out they had pretty well the same stuff I had and more. So we called a neighborhood meeting, a few of the other people were interested, and we decided that we would combine our stuff. So we formed a depot, a central shed, where you could sign out items as you needed them. The extra things we either sold off or donated to an appropriate cause. So there were many benefits to this. Clearing space, friendship, camaraderie. Uh, who knows, by a show of hands, who knows the name of their neighbors by first name on either side of them, where they are right now? Okay, I'd say about 40% or so. That's pretty high, higher than I expected. And uh, the exciting thing about our project was that a lot of the people that resisted and were hesitant, they ended up embracing it. They wanted to be part of this new trend. And now they're our biggest advocates. Okay, now then we said, okay, what's the biggest object in our lives, the biggest expense other than our house? And it's the car. So can we bring in this same philosophy to the car? So in general, we spend about 10,000 a year on our cars. That's for uh, initial purchase, insurance, fuel, maintenance. That's uh, 35 bucks a day, if you drive it or not. So indirectly, there are also expenses, which are probably more. All the roads, infrastructure, uh, lights, policing, ticketing, you name it, signage. So do you need your own car? Who, who here doesn't have a car? Maybe 10% of the people. 
which is pretty good. Uh, who here is from a two-car family that doesn't need their car? They would reconsider joining the Hamilton Car Share. When you talk about persistence, there are some people from the Hamilton Car Share project that we met for, well, once a, once a week for three or four months. And at one point, frustration set in. We said, let's go. This is a, an opportunity that we shouldn't have to sell because people are going to be embracing it. So anyway, in my community, the car share has taken off. And some of these scenarios that are hypothetical could really happen. OK, so to get into the car share, you pay a $400 fully refundable membership. You have to have a reasonable driving record to get approved as a driver, clearly. And then you rent the car by the hour, 3 to $4 per hour. There's also a small mileage rate. So the community was keen. Our initial set was 60 homes. Uh, many of the homes had more than one car. So anyways, for the first year, we ended up uh, bringing tw or g taking 20 cars off the road and replacing them with two cars. So just looking at insurance, uh, people saved $1,800 a year, typically, because you pay about $2,000 a year for your car when it's your own car. And then through the car share program, it's only 200 a year, $14 a month. So it's a very attractive option. So in my community next year, 20 more cars will probably be removed, et cetera. We had one challenge. Now we had all these asphalt spaces that didn't have cars on them. So what we did is we ended up pulling them up and building nice front yard gardens. In each property, we planted, here are some plants, but we also planted vegetables and trees. So anything was possible. So I'll reiterate the law of nature that change is constant and solutions to challenges are local and simple, but they do require determination. I also put this slide up here because it is the change of seasons. So now fall is setting in appropriately. So how far do we take this cooperative model? Think about the mailbox or a paper. A lot of neighbors would get uh, the paper delivered independently for their, to their home, and they would pay for that themselves without any contact with the neighbor. So this was reviewed as well. A lot of people shared newspapers with a couple neighbors and uh, mailboxes even. Some people wanted a central location and wireless internet and cable. Another option was the waste. Uh, currently, once a week, the truck comes by and he stops at every single house. And you can hear the brakes. You know that truck weighs 10 tons or so. And two employees hop out, load the recyclables, trash, and a green bin on the truck at each house. So we decided initially to pair up homes. So for every two homes, you have them put the garbage beside each other. And what that did, that reduced the number of stops for the truck by 50%. Uh, right now, we do put out green bins. However, down the road, we're going to be getting rid of those as we uh, use our own backyard composters. Because you think about it, it's not very efficient to transport compostable material. First of all, you get it picked up. You transport it tens of kilometers away. It's composted out of main site, and then it's brought back the next year. So another cooperative opportunity for efficiency. Okay, the roof. Energy-wise, we have all these uh, roofs in Hamilton in every city. And it's an opportunity to capture the radiant energy that's hitting that roof. So uh, in the future, roofs will be viewed as appliances and uh, solar hot water, photovoltaics, which is solar electricity, and small wind where possible. I just wanted to highlight the nuclear power, because right now we do pay for nuclear power in each bill. However, uh, this is a technology that can't be fully insured, and there's a reason. And if you have any doubt, I recommend the video, The Battle of Chernobyl. Next one, holistic health. 
At one time, Hamilton Health Sciences, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say the name of the institution, a local hospital was the largest employer in my city. That's a symptom, that's not a good thing to brag about within any city. That's a symptom of some healing required and a focus on local food and physical health. This trend was reversed when we introduced the car share because in part, now we had more gardening space or local gardens in front of the homes and also people walked more and drove less. My water, rain barrels and more. So basically at one time the city would collect all household wastewater and uh, rainwater in combined sewer overflow systems. They, they collect that in huge tanks and then they would treat that water over a period of time. So the challenge was it was too much pavement being installed within the city. And the straw on the camel's back was when a valley was actually paved to build a road. So every time there was a, a rain event, a flood occurred. And the water system couldn't handle the capacity and that water backed up into people's basements. So to overcome this, innovation at the community level occurred again. We had homes installing rain barrels, as mentioned before, diversion of downspouts, residential gray water systems that fed into the garden and onto the, the lawn, and then compostable toilets, as well as green roofs. So these are all exciting technologies that people had talked about for so long, they learned about them, they, uh, you know, anyways, it never moved beyond that to action until this community model took off. And another fact, in most towns, the pumping of this water to the homes is one of the major users of electricity in each home. I should note as well that these ideas were not all in the one community. Once the car share cooperative took off, the community started watching this video and other, other uh, informative pieces and they became contagious. So communities all over the place became creative with this cooperative idea. Okay, we'll talk about the final point, my transportation. It stayed grounded and afloat. Why do I say that? Because in Hamilton, we're a prime, beautiful location, right by the escarpment. We have a beautiful shipping access right by the water. And we're hungry for a light rail system. In the 1880s, we were able to build uh, construct a, a rail line across the country, yet today, in 2009, we struggle to get a regular uh, rail transport system to Toronto, the next hub within the city. There's something wrong with this cooperative model here. As well, within my city here, the airport in an aerotropolis far from the downtown core is touted as the ultimate vision of the future. And it's known at these UN conferences, people talk about the airline industry. The airlines are closing down. Airports are consolidating. And as the next wave of fuel prices spike up, as well as the connection between uh, disease vectors on airplanes occurs, then I feel that airlines and airplanes are meeting an obvious demise. Anyways, the point here is to take a breath and remember what the three points are that I'm reinforcing here. Uh, don't get frustrated. Change is the law of nature. And every community is still wrestling with the old guard and this old way of thinking. And like the Berlin Wall, the Aerotropolis and other projects are still are symbols of that uh, resistance to look forward to sustainability in the future. So fortunately, we have a message to carry us forward. And here it is. Join me if you would like. The law of nature is change is constant. Solutions to all challenges are local and simple. And we must be the change. So please get involved. It's your choice. Thank you.